Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna do a Q&A video from the comment I posted recently, but let's just dive on in. Okay, so the first question here is gonna come from Amadou. I'm sorry if I mispronounced anyone's name in this process, but let's <laughs> keep going. And the question is, is this a great time to be a quant once the pandemic is resolved? Um, the economy had taken a hit and jobs for quant will raise once this is all over, in my opinion. So basically they're wanting to know what I think about the coronavirus, whole outbreak pandemic that we're dealing with now, uh, and jobs for quants. All right, so simply put, I'm going to look at this from two sides. So I've been predicting a market crash or essentially a recession for about a year, year and a half, maybe two years. Yes, I've been fairly pessimistic for a long time. Um, I'm by no means an expert at predicting things, right? It's just, it's been so high for so long. People are overconfident. Um, there's just a lot of things contributing to this. Now, before I would figure when we have crises, uh, quants and risk management. So for example, my field, all of a sudden they hire a bunch of people because banks realize that they've been neglecting the risk side and they've been telling us that, you know, essentially you're not important as the economy is doing really well. When the economy tanks and does horrible, uh, they hire tons of risk quants because they have all these regulations they have to meet. Um, and basically jobs go up for the risk side. Now, the inverse is true for trading. When the markets are great and everybody's making money, they hire lots of quants to do like quantitative research on the investment side. Um, now, when markets tank though, right, they're not making any money, they can't afford to keep all the people they have, they typically fire and let go a lot of quants. But now with the coronavirus, what do I think? I think it's gonna be similar, um, but I think the risk side is either gonna stay the same because this isn't necessarily like a regulatory issue, it's just like the market kind of bottomed out and no one's blaming the banks for it. And so because of that, um, I can say, I think risk jobs will stay the same or they might increase just a little bit here as we get to riskier times. Banks might have a little more fear. Uh, and when fear sets in, they typically hire more risk quants or risk management people. Um, the flip side, I think will remain true again, where you'll see a consistent amount of investors. Um, but in this case, I think there will be most likely less investing quants as the markets tank. Um, in this case, right, it doesn't matter whose fault it is or who's pointing the finger at who. Um, at the end of the day, I think there'll be less investing jobs moving forward if we end up continually seeing the market decline um, for the next so many months. And I do think that's going to happen. Okay, second question here is by Kennedy. Can quants work in manufacturing companies specifically in what field or area? Okay, so I'm going to answer this now and I'm actually really excited you asked this question because this is the flip question from what I typically do. Um, most people ask, you know, um, Dimitri, I'm in some other field and I want to be a quant. Like I want to be an actuary. I'm an actuary and I want to work in quant finance. And realistically, the skills between like actuary and quant are similar or data scientist and quant. But it's really hard to move across fields sometimes because you're already branded and labeled. So I always mention to people like, yes, you might have an actuarial degree, but you're not gonna have a lot of specialization uh, in financial engineering applications, even with other exams. Um, it's just gonna be a hard shift and a hard move because quants are typically trained for a very specific task. But yes, it is possible to go from that side. Now going the other way, I'm gonna give you essentially the same answer. Um, so I used to work in manufacturing um, at a startup company before. Again, you might be able to utilize a lot of the same skills. A lot of the quantitative finance skills that you'll learn, I don't think will be applicable to manufacturing. But again, the biggest hurdle is going to be those in manufacturing that are hiring. Uh, first of all, aren't gonna know what quants are or financial engineers. So they'll think you're kind of like, like, what is this? Like you're a business person? Like we don't need that. Um, <laughs> and then on the uh, second part here, it's gonna be challenging as well because those that work in more or less like operational research, if that's what you're looking at for the manufacturing side, or even like data analytics for them, um, Again, they're gonna be looking for someone that fits more of what they're expected to seeing. So even though a lot of your skills are gonna carry over, it'd be very challenging, I think, to make that jump unless you can sell them on it. So again, it's the same as the actuary to data scientist to quant, like the three of us here. It's hard to move between them sometimes. Um, the same's gonna be applied to manufacturing here. So it's gonna be challenging to move over. If you can convince someone, great, but it will be a lot of like explanation and challenge to move to that side. Okay, and Nathaniel asks, what are your thoughts on using Kegel as a guide inspiration for self-learning projects? Um, so this is kind of interesting because a lot of you know I don't do Kegel, I don't do Coursera's, I don't do Udemy, I don't do any of that, but I do think Kegels are an awesome way to learn. So 
They're not like a put a stamp on your resume kind of thing. But I think Kegels are awesome because they have real world data from real companies and real people. Um, when you're in academia, for example, most of the data you're using is like either fake data or it's data that's been processed and cleaned or that data shows the lesson they're trying to teach very simply. And when you get into the real world, regardless of if you're in finance or you know tech or anywhere else, the data is messy, it's dirty, it's a pain to deal with half the time. And then you have some model structure and it should fit, but it doesn't fit and you have all these issues. So I think Kaggle is actually an awesome source if you want to learn um, to work with real data. Um, it's a great way to do self-learning. It's a great way to do a project because they kind of define things for you. So overall, I am a big fan of Kaggle if you're a student or someone who just wants to learn um, how to actually do more of the quant and kind of apply many of these skills. Okay, and Artem is the next one. I'm curious what kind of precaution steps banks were or are taking now amid the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, how does it impact you know, model development, model validation? What kind of lessons should the industry take from this unpredictable event? Uh, greatly appreciate your videos. Stay safe, Dimitri. Okay, so for all of you out there, stay safe as well. It's been a crazy time. Um, so this is actually a really good question as well because uh, when I do model validation, so if somebody builds a model, they write a bunch of documentation, and then they send it over to me and I look at it, one of the things that we require is continuity planning. So let's say you have a model and it prices something daily. We require that you have a continuity plan. So if like an earthquake happens or you know a tornado comes in or a flood or something, what is the goal? Like how do we mitigate that risk and how do we keep that process running? And I always ask this on validations and people like roll their eyes like, Dimitri, this isn't going to happen. Like we have all these systems and I still require them to put all the verbiage in and discuss like, okay, people can work from home. We have backup servers that we already pay for, for example, uh, or this is a corporation. And so they have their processes and then I require, they send all their paperwork to me so I can look at it. Uh, and people think I'm crazy and they've made fun of me for years from writing findings on this. And now it's came to fruition Banks are prepared uh, because we have required this. Uh, we never knew a pandemic was gonna come or like a virus outbreak, right? We're looking at, like I said, casual things that happen somewhat common, like earthquakes, you know, floods, tornadoes, things like that. Pandemic was not expected. Um, from everything I've done now, most banks are either working from home full time for those employees that can, or they were doing like a shift where it's like half the employees would come in this week and then half would come in the next week and then they would rotate. Um, but in general, model development, model validation, like I'm not even seeing a bump in my schedule. Like I'm on track. We're all doing the exact same job. Uh, many of you know I work from home a few days a week anyways. Um, so now I'm just working from home full time. We don't see any kind of hiccups or bumps. For banking as a whole though, it is a challenge because a lot of us have Right, branches. So for example, you need to go down to a teller. How do you maintain that and manage that? I don't really know, right? It's going to be a point maybe where it's so bad we just close them and you do all of your banking online for a while. Um, again, I don't really know and I don't speak on behalf of any of the banks in this scenario, but um, yeah, model development, model validation. Most of us can do our jobs all online, so it has had minimal impact. And luckily, we do have laptops and we are prepared um, to work remote. I should mention too, at another company I had, they actually had a backup facility. So like if something happened to your office, like say, I don't know, the office blew up or something fell over, I don't know, something crazy happened. They actually had a contract in place with another company where they could just remotely reconnect and move to another location. Um, it's like an insurance policy kind of, but for a location and they did have that as well. So there's all kinds of things in place that banks have put. They're definitely prepared. Um, I wouldn't worry about any of the banks. Again, a lot of these jobs have not changed at all. All right, Eshlan 1310X, I'm guessing that's how you pronounce that, or Lashlan 1310X. Could external changes in the market, such as new laws, be modeled in the same manner as step inputs, impulse inputs, and control systems theory? Um, yes and no. So I'm gonna explain this a little bit. So one of the hardest aspects when you take people from a science background, so like control systems, um, and specifically like when you take like physicists, for example, they think the world works based on laws. And that's true for the physical world, but humans are irrational in many ways and they don't do what you would expect, even with models and data and everything. And because of that, um, there's never going to be a law or the way that the markets work. So models for soft sciences, like 
finance and markets. Um, they're nearly impossible to predict, but there are ways to kind of make assumptions and work things in. And that leads me to the step function modeling. Yes, you can use it to model it, but again, they're gonna have to look at data and you're gonna have to try to estimate what is that step and how much is that step, right? Because typically in other control systems, um, there's ways to kind of calculate these and get a very close estimate. For markets, when you have new regulations, new laws, banks, for example, and people and businesses all respond differently than expected in most scenarios. So yes, you can make some assumptions and you can actually model in like a break in time or a step function um, and you can actually model that. But there's a lot of assumptions baking into this with finance and markets. So anyways, um, Shahar... Shah Haria Habib, okay, sorry, I definitely butchered that one. Um, is it true that only one in 10 people become quants? Um, depends how you're defining that. So one in 10 people is 10% of the population. No, it's far smaller than that. But I think what you're actually asking is uh, one in 10 people that probably go to school to be a quant actually become a quant. It depends, I don't know, I haven't seen the actual data on this, but if you look at um, defining what a quant is and what the quant job is, that will vary from person to person. For me, it's model development, model validation, right? I don't really care if you're doing quantitative research um, at a hedge fund and you're building models for a hedge fund and you're doing all that, or you're somebody who's actually doing model development and validation at a bank. Same jobs, uh, same skill sets. Again, quantitative modeling and mathematics. Is it one in 10? For a lot of programs, I think it's higher than that. It's definitely not one in 10. It might be like, I don't know, six, seven, or eight out of 10. But that might seem a little high as well because I have seen programs where most of them go into like data processing, data cleaning. So they work for like Bloomberg, for example, or Reuters, um, or all these other companies. And yes, they're finance companies, but they're just doing data. Like one of the ways, I guess, to kind of split this out and define this uh, is that if you need a master's degree as a minimum requirement, it's a quant job. If you need a bachelor's, um, you could have easily done the job without actually getting a quantitative master's. So I don't really view it as quantitative finance. Um, one in 10 does seem really harsh, like 10% only going into that. But again, 70, 80% seems way too much. It's, it's probably between like, I don't know, 30 to 60% depending on the program. Um, and again, with so many programs now, especially the fake ones, it might be closer to the 30% side. But yes, it is true. Lots of people go out and get degrees, financial engineering degrees, stats degrees and all that uh, with the expectation of going into quantitative finance and they don't end up doing it. So not quite 10%, but it's true. All right. Baron Casual TM asks, thanks for doing this. Not really quant related. What's your opinion on technical analysis? And it's used in trading versus other more quantitative methods, especially nowadays where high frequency trading and algo trading are much more widespread. And is uh, technical analysis or manual trading still going to be affected in the future? Also, why does alpha returns diminish over time? Okay, this is a question and a question, essentially. Um, technical analysis, yes, I've, I've, I've done it, right? We've learned it in, in finance when I had my undergrad. Um, people swear by it. But one of the hardest things with trading is that essentially you only have two outcomes in a trade, right? You either, you, you buy it, for example, and it either goes up or it goes down. So there's only two outcomes. You either win or lose. That's all there is to it. Um, if you look at a short position, it's the exact same, right? If it goes down, you make money. If it goes up, you lose money. It's a binary case. So it's like flipping a coin, right? Am I really smart and I can pick them? It's really hard to tell if theories are correct or not. It's one of the reasons I avoid much of the trading topics because the vast majority of the theories out there and things that are taught online aren't actually true. Uh, technical analysis, people are gonna swear by it and say it's amazing, they're making millions of dollars. But I'm gonna say no, technical analysis is not really useful. And the reason being is that um, a lot of people use things that are based on technical analysis, on statistics, so more on the quant side, but they actually have theory backing it and then it builds out more complicated model structures and so because of that, our accuracy is high, be is far better, right? It's a higher accuracy. And so I think a lot of this technical analysis is just people getting on runs, perhaps. Um, I'm not a fan of technical analysis. I don't think it adds a lot of value. I think it's overly simplistic and too dumbed down to have value. So that's that. Okay, and then it kind of mentions high frequency trading um, and manual trading. So I'll mention that real quick. Um, being a manual trader, um, and like trading, for example, with your own money, it's like being a person in the ocean. 
Like you have no impact on where the water flows or where it goes. You're literally just one person. If you took 100,000 traders, right? So 100,000 people and you plunk them into the water. Uh, again, you still have no impact on the ocean. It's so vast and so large. Uh, with computers trading and high frequency trading um, and just the amount of computer power that we use these days, uh, the volume, for example, just overwhelms individual traders. And so realistically, you have zero impact on it. It's also one reason why you can't really make that much money doing it. And that's why I'm not a big fan of encouraging individuals to trade. If you want to start a business doing it and you have a strategy and you build a team and you get investments, uh, you can scale these up and make profits off of them. And that makes more sense. But again, manual traders, I, I, it's basically a dead field in general. Yes, there's still people doing it, but I'm not a fan of it. I don't think it's going to last very long. Uh, and I don't think the returns from these funds are going to be very good. Now, diversification is a completely different story. We can talk about that. Uh, diversification is very well supported academically and in practice with real data. So that's inactive management, but I'm not going to cover that. Uh, also, why do alphas diminish basically across time? So let's just imagine this in a simple case. Let's say I put, um, I don't know, I have a pile of pennies and it's $10 worth of pennies here and I just plunk them down on the table. And I have a room full of people and I say, okay, um, this is alpha, right? There's free money on the table, nothing's required. Uh, whoever wants it, come get it, right? Everyone's gonna sprint in and they're gonna take out all of this alpha and they're gonna move it away. And then if I do this every morning, right? People are gonna start showing up earlier and earlier because they know that I'm bringing the pennies. There's a pattern, there's a trend, there's a prediction. This is the same with markets, right? People see some mispricing, like they see me as the mispricing. I'm the fool that magically brings in money and just throws it on the table. Um, people are gonna suck that up very quickly. And because of that, that's a similar fact to alpha. So again, a more simple way to look at it is say a stock price is trading at $101 and it should be trading at $100. Um, there's a way to arbitrage that essentially by um, buying and selling, which I'm not gonna cover in this video, but you can arbitrage that $1. And as soon as you do that, you're taking the $1 and enough people will realize there's that $1 there to be had and they take the $1 away and they force the price now to be $100. And now no one's willing to buy it at 101 because they know it's only worth $100. So essentially that alpha or that gap, that mispricing um, disappears because people become smart uh, as different participants in the market take advantage of that. If you're a massive large fund and you take advantage of that, a lot of times you are the one that forced the market to move because you're so large. Uh, and because of that, that essentially gets rid of your alpha. So you have to come up with new strategies. So hope that answers your time on why alpha diminishes over time. Um, basically, markets are efficient and they converge to the true value and then you lose your alpha. Okay, bar tech uh, with an average... With an above average but far from genius level IQ, is it realistic to pursue a career in quantitative finance, data science, actuarial sciences? Um, I recently published a video, which I will, I'll link it below. Uh, it's a podcast on my educational journey. I don't think I'm a genius by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I'm definitely fairly smart, at least from my own perspective here, without seeming, uh, I don't know, too cocky and having too much of an ego. I think in general, anyone who's just average IQ. If you really enjoy the material and you like the material, you can do it. It just takes time, right? You just need to grow and learn as a person uh, and figure out more or less who you are, what you like to do. But again, learning is like this layering process. And I've mentioned it in past videos. If you search like education layers, maybe I'll link that below. Um, it's just building, right? Like learning like simple arithmetic, which you learned in elementary school, and then slowly learning things like algebra and then calculus and then you know, stochastic, calculi stochastic calculus and then, I don't know, tensor calculus, and like, there's all kinds of topics out there, guys. Like, the world is massive. There's tons of information. Um, no, I don't think you need to be a genius to do this. You just need to essentially take the time to learn it. If you don't enjoy it, though, it's not worth forcing yourself to do it because, again, there's a vast ocean of information and trying to cover everything, you'll never do it. Um, if you're interested, though, it's like a fun journey. So you enjoy collecting all these information and data and then later using it, and a lot of it you'll never use, but it's just fun. So... Do you need to be a genius? No. Um, let's jump on here to rhythm. I am currently pursuing a quantitative finance degree from Rutgers University. I have developed a keen interest in programming. I plan to learn about data structures and algorithms over the summer. Um, are there roles in quant finance that need both finance and computer science skills to perform the job? My interest also lies in stochastic calculus and credit risk modeling. Okay, so there's a lot here. If you just focus on the computer science and finance side, 
There are actually jobs, for example, like implementation at banks. Um, I don't know what they call them, programmers, essentially computer scientists uh, at trading firms where you implement the code. And these situations, you need to be a genius at programming. So they hire undergrads, for example, to do this. Again, I don't think they're quants, they're computer scientists, but they're like 10 times better than any quant out there at programming because that's what they're specialized in, right? So they're going to specialize in optimizing code and programs to run. That's one job you can do with just computer science and an interest in finance because it's tied to it. Um, Then if you tack on the stochastic calculus and credit risk modeling, now you're just covering all of quant finance. That scenario is more or less like a model developer or validator. But again, it's more going to be focused on statistics and mathematics. Um, And then you're just going to be using um, programming like R, Python, SAS, for example, as tools um, to implement your ideas onto paper to do calculations to see how things turn out to build a model. So you won't be doing that much programming. um, But again, doing stochastic calculus is more math driven and again, more derivative pricing and actual financial engineering. Uh, Credit risk modeling is more just model development or risk management. Uh, And so again, you'd be doing a lot more statistics. But again, to do stats, you need to understand math and computer science. Okay, and Manuel asked, Hi, Dimitri, I wanted to ask for your opinion on high-frequency trading. If you could explain a bit how it works and a more or less what is needed to work within that area. Um, they're an undergrad studying quantitative research methods at UCL in the UK and wanting to own a quant finance. Okay, first off, you'll eventually need a master's or a PhD for the most part. So that's the education piece here. Um, high-frequency trading, though, essentially just comes down to the speed and the number of trades here. Um, so for example, in markets, a lot of times there's an inefficiency that's very, very small. So like a 10th of a penny, a hundredth of a penny, uh, it's not worth trying to take that risk to get that. But with high frequency trading, you can essentially get that little bit of mispricing, but you do so many of those trades at a high frequency, right? High frequency trading, um, that you end up stacking those little tiny, tiny bits into an actual like meaningful profit. But high frequency trading, Uh, is going to be just the frequency of the trades in general. So algorithmic trading can fall into that. Um, Again, uh, I'm not gonna get into too many details on it, but again, high frequency trading has very specialized components as well, which I should note. Um, There are computer science people that are very specialized in this. Many have masters and PhDs. Uh, They're gonna be the gurus and like the experts on optimizing code with the hardware you have and selecting hardware and doing all that. Uh, High frequency trading is very, very dependent on optimizing the trades and the execution times and all that. So you really need someone that's specialized, not someone who's a quantitative finance expert. Uh, Quantitative finance in general, right? I would encourage you to go to quantitative research. Uh, Typically, you'll be the person developing the strategies, looking at data, processing all the data, uh, coming up with ideas, and then working with the traders, uh, senior management who's looking at strategy, and the computer science people to get this all implemented into a structure and a framework um, where you can trade at very, very high frequencies and beat other people uh, to those profits. And this is one reason why humans essentially, like the manual trading, as I mentioned earlier, is going away. Because as soon as those mispricings occur, um, these high frequency trading comes in and they quickly remove all that. Um, There's pros and cons on both sides of if it's good or bad for markets. I think it's fairly good because it does create highly efficient markets. Um, prices are going to remain in a fairly accurate pricing because if it does deviate, um, there are people that are willing to take advantage of that and correct the pricing. So high frequency trading just has to do with the speed of transactions and the number of transactions. Okay, and then finally, Okonom, again, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, They asked, uh, how do you differentiate market movements driven by bots rather than the usual market movements? Um, Okay, so this is a challenging question in itself. Market, so let's just talk about humans versus bots quickly. Um, Humans typically do things in round numbers just because that's how we process and think. So for example, if you see trades in the volumes, the number of shares is like an even number or a five. So like 100, 105, 55, 1,000, 1,050, right? Those are usually human traders because, uh, right, the numbers are even. The same goes for pricing. So if you have like, I don't know, stop losses, at specific prices, or if you have orders that are being placed here to buy, um, a lot of times those thresholds will be like at $97.50 um, or $97 or $97.25, for example, right? They're thinking in human dollar terms. It's really rare to see humans unless you're trying to like, I don't know, confuse these bots or you have a model that you're using that's actually pricing them out. 
Um, but then you would have something more exact, like $97.23, right? Or it's like, I need uh, you know 57 shares, exactly. Like So bots typically do things more numerically across the board. They don't really care about rounding, which is the human component. Um, so how do you determine what is being driven by bots rather than the market? Um, <laughs> that's a whole problem in trading in itself. It's a whole field of studies. Uh, again, it's challenging. There's no simple answer to this, right? There's not like I can say this is driven by bots, this is driven by markets. Uh, typically, when we see market crashes, a lot of times people blame like bots or algorithms for this. A lot of times, it's just because the markets are deteriorating as well. Sometimes there's a mistake, so don't get me wrong. Somebody puts in too many zeros, which we've seen in the past, uh, and then all of a sudden it tanks and all the algorithms go with it. Uh, but again, being able to differentiate bots and markets, I don't really know what to tell you on that because it's extremely challenging. You could build models to help try to detect these, but again, uh, there's not like a right answer. We don't really know in general, like, oh, this is exactly where the market's going to go, and then if it deviates, it's a bot. Uh, there's not really a way to do that. And as I mentioned in the last one, uh, like high frequency trading, for example, um, has definitely helped make markets more efficient. So essentially, it's a you can view it as a bot, um, but they're actually beneficial in many ways. So, anyways, that's me answering all of your questions here on the Q and A. Uh, we will do another one in the future as well. So if you have more questions, you can just put them, I guess, on the bottom of this one, or just wait, and I'll hopefully post another Q and A. But anyways, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, until next time.